Good morning, everybody, and a special welcome to Admiral Johan Rutif. He's often done presentations for us over the last few years. We've come to rely on him, and it's wonderful that uh, he's able to join us again. Uh, most of you know him, but I'd like to say something about him. Uh, he was born in, in Cape Town in 1946. He went to school at Jan van Riebeek where he matriculated in 62. He, he then went to the South African Military Academy, where he graduated in 1967 as the top student in his class. His first naval appointment was as an anti-submarine warfare officer, and a very distinguished career followed. He worked in Israel and in the UK, and in America, he has got a, he had a global experience and this very distinguished career culminating in his promotion to Vice Admiral and Chief of the South African Navy in 2000. So we are very fortunate to have this experienced Admiral living in our midst and able to share his knowledge with us, which goes far beyond what you would normally expect of a naval man. Today, of course, he's taking us into outer space. Thank you, Johanna, and welcome. We look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Leticia. Just as a correction, the top student in my final year at the Academy was Pierre de Villiers. I was the top naval student. Today, we're going to talk something about rocket propulsion because there's been some developments in this century and we need to look at the future. I need to go back in time a bit and do a little bit of rocket science just to get everybody in the same frame of mind. I intend to keep it at a very simple level. Newton's laws of motion are important to us. It says an object at rest or an object in motion will stay at rest, will stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force. Uh, it's known as the principle of inertia. The rate of change of the momentum of a body is directly proportional to the force applied and occurs in the same direction of the force. And then law number three, which is all important for rocketeers, all forces between two objects in, exist in equal and opposite directions. At the bottom, I've drawn a bar which represents a rocket. It has a solid propellant which is in blue and it's burning on the inside perforation. Out of the nozzle, exhaust gas is visible. There you can see the exhaust gas. And as the exhaust gas shoots out this direction, so the rocket moves forward in that direction. It's rather like one pushes a car that's stuck in sand. We also need to talk about destinations. Where are we going with our rockets? The basic paths of outer space are called orbits, and they are controlled by Johann Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Law number one, the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun at one end, and here you can see the sun On one focus and the other focus over here is empty. There is a planet orbiting the sun. Law number two, I haven't illustrated, but it has to do with the motion of the planet. The closer the planet is to the sun, the faster it moves. And it moves slowly in this area. And to calculate the orbital period, the orbital period it's the time taken for the planet to orbit the sun is proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis. Now, the major axis is this distance. The minor axis is that distance. And the orbital period is proportional to the third cube, third power of the length of the semi-major axis. And I intend stopping it here, but 
it's important to know that most satellite orbits are circles where the major axis and the semi-major axis are equal to one another. And then the eccentricity of the ellipse tends to zero. There are some highly eccentric orbits as well, which is used specifically by Russia in what they call the Molniya and the Tundra orbits, where the satellites go high up to the north and stay quite a long time up above the horizon to provide for communications at high latitudes. The last thing I want to say about orbital mechanics is to say that an orbit has an inclination. If it is traveling in line on the plane of the equator, it has an inclination of zero. As the orbit moves away from that line, there's a 40 degree inclination. And once it gets to a polar orbit over here, it has a 90 degree inclination. Most satellites are launched towards the east in the direction of which the Earth turns. That helps to make the satellite move faster and helped by the rotation of the Earth. One country, however, launches to the west, um, and that country is Israel because they do not wish the parts of their rocket to fall on the Arabi Arabian countries to the east. Rockets which are traveling in this arc are called prograde or, or rockets or orbits, and orbits which turn this direction over the other one are called retrograde orbits. And this, I wish to stop the discussion of orbits, we now know that satellite orbits are mostly circular. They mostly operate from the west to the east. Most of them are not close to the equator, but there's a specific group that are on the equator. If we look at satellite orbits, one needs to know how far they are away from the surface of the Earth. We divide them into three groups. Low Earth orbits, LEO, which are orbits below 2,000 kilometers in altitude. Medium Earth orbits, MEO, below 35,000 kilometers in altitude. And geostationary orbit, which is a very specific orbit, which is at 35,786 kilometers from the surface. And is on the plane of the equator. The geostationary satellites all stay above the same spot on Earth and is the reason why you don't have to run out and adjust your satellite dish from time to time. The closer you are to the surface, the faster you move. At 200 kilometers, you will move at 28,000 kilometers an hour in order not to fall back to Earth. When a satellite is delivered by a company that launches satellites, they normally push it up to 200 kilometers and they accelerate the satellite 28,000 kilometers per hour. Then they hand over the satellite to the owner who will adjust the orbit as he requires. The space station over here, it's at 420 kilometers altitude. It travels at 27,530 kilometers per hour. And it orbits the Earth once every one hour and 32 minutes, 58 seconds. For those of us who watch the space station from time to time, it moves fast, and that is the reason. The Hubble Space Telescope has at 539 altitude. It travels at 27,000 kilometers per hour, and it has also a one hour, 35 minute period. Between of below medium Earth orbit 
are the satellites used for navigation. GPS, Global Positioning System, which we all have on our cell phones. GLONASS is the Russian equivalent of GPS. It is at 19,000 kilometers and it orbits in every 11 hours, 14 minutes. Galileo is the third satellite navigation system that belongs to the European Space Agency. It's quite high, it's at 23,400 kilometers and it orbits once every 14 hours. Where do we edge of space? In other words, how far do we have to travel up in the sky before we are in outer space? The Karman limit, it's named for Mr. Theodor von Karman, uh, is defined by the Federation Aeronautic International as being at 100 kilometers above the Earth's mean and sea level. So if you're at 101 kilometers above that, you are in outer space. Theodor von Karman calculated the height of which an aircraft can no longer be supported by the atmosphere. And that is about 85 kilometers above the surface. The first rocket to cross the Karman line did so on 20 June 1944. It was a V-2 rocket. Those of you who remember the Second World War, this was uh, the rocket that was dropped in London in the hundreds, and it was a German ballistic missile. The architect was this gentleman over here, Mr. Werner von Braun, who escaped to America at the end of the war. And from the V2 onto the moon. In 1960, von Braun was appointed director of the Marshall Space Science Flight Center, and he was the chief architect of the Saturn V heavy lift rocket, which took the first man to orbit the moon in December 1968. And of course, they landed on the moon in June 1969. Interesting enough, it took a mere 24 years from first crossing the Kármán line for the first humans to leave the low Earth orbit and to journey to another heavenly body. By December 1972, 12 men had walked on the moon and a further 15 have actually orbited the moon. Here you have a picture of the Atlas V as it is launched. Something about the rocket propulsion, there's a convention. A rocket motors, if somebody speak about a rocket motor, they in fact implying a solid fuel rocket motor. Rocket engines are using liquid propellant and have many moving parts. Hybrid engines are, are a mix between solid fuel and liquid fuel motors. In a hybrid engine, I will not discuss, but basically it's an engine where you control the oxidizer by means of a valve. Thrusters are small rockets called the reaction control systems, which uses mechanical energy, hypergolic fuel, electrical energy, nuclear energy, or plasma, and I will come to all those in the future. We start off with a solid fuel rocket motor. On the right here, you've got an artist's rendition of what the new space launch system will look like. It is fitted out with two solid fuel rocket boosters. Each booster are 730 tons and 54 meters long. They're massive and they burn for 126 seconds. Those boosters will take the rocket up into outer space. The advantage is, and here I've got a picture of a solid cutaway of a solid fuel rocket booster. 
The black is the solid fuel. It's normally a mixture of a propellant and an oxidizer. Point number two is a small rocket engine that ignites this whole thing. Number three is the perforation down the shaft of the motor. Number four is the rocket nozzle. And number five, the exhaust gas. By changing the manner in which the rocket propellant is cast and set, you can increase or decrease the size of the area that burns. Normally, they use a star uh, design, which provides a very large area that can be put to light. If you want a slow burn, you just fill the rocket up completely and it burns slowly like a cigarette from its one end. It's used extensively in missiles on Earth. And it is known to be simple, reliable, and a cheap design, and it has no moving parts. Its disadvantages is that it's normally a one-time rocket. And B, you cannot control the thrust. Once you light it, it burns until it's burnt out. You cannot change that situation. They actually do change it by fitting a flight termination device that will blow, blow the rockets to bits if you do wish to stop it from flying. Liquid filled rocket engines are complex machines. Here on the right, you see the Raptor engine. And it's the same engine, but they have different size exhaust bells. Liquid fueled rocket engines are today are normally propelled by liquid hydrogen, LH2 is known, kerosene, a very refined kerosene so that it doesn't burn uh, soot, and kerosene we call paraffin in South Africa. And then newly onto the block is a liquid methane motor, uh, engine, sorry, which burns CH4. Now, these fuel uh, propellants are all stored in a liquid state in the tanks. Liquid hydrogen is minus 252 degrees Celsius. Uh, liquid methane is minus 162 Celsius. And RP1, rocket propellant 1, is normally cooled to minus 7 degrees Celsius to give it a thermal advantage. The oxidizer in most, all these are, are liquid oxygen. And the lock, locks itself is at a minus 132 degrees Celsius. Types of rocket engines, open cycle, closed cycle, full flow. I will explain the full flow cycle, but you will get the idea. What is important on this picture is there's a lady standing here, and it gives you an idea of the size of these motors or engines. This engine with a small bell is called the sea level engine. And this motor with a very large bell is called a vacuum engine. When a rocket engine fires, the exhaust is held in its shape by the air pressure outside it. If the same motor should go into the vacuum of space, the exhaust will in fact go sideways. And you will lose a lot of the power of the exhaust. Hence, for vacuum rated engines, they build a very large bell to retain the gas so that it keeps on pushing in the right direction and in the best way. To explain to you how a full flow rocket engine works, don't worry about the designation full flow. I've drawn this picture. In the center, 
you have SpaceX's newest Starship. And I've used this just to tell you, to show you that a rocket is actually a pipe with large tanks inside it. One tank carries liquid oxygen. The other tank, in this case, carries liquid methane. There are two small tanks. There's a small header tank with methane in it and a small header tank with oxygen inside. Those tanks are there for landing purposes. Once again, here is a picture on the left of what a Raptor engine looks like. And you will understand that it's a very complex piece of machine. It's got it's a plumber's dream. There are pipes going everywhere. To look at the picture uh, to see how it works, you have fuel coming in and you have oxidizer, oxidizer coming in. This thing burns fuel at about a ton a second. For this purpose, it has very large turbine-driven pumps. This pump over here pumps fuel down to the rocket. This pump over here pumps oxidizer down to the rocket, out on this side. This is a turbo motor. And that's a turbo motor with a preheater fitted each side to provide the gas to drive this turbine. This turbine drives that pump. This turbine drives this pump over here. What is important to realize is that the combustion is at a tremendous temperature. And it is such a high temperature that it will probably melt the engine if we don't cool it. So the system is so arranged that the cold fuel is piped down to the bell and it's carried up a little grooves inside the bell and around the combustion chamber from the bottom, inside on this side as well. Temperature inside the combustion chamber is characteristically about 3,500 degrees Celsius. Because of the cooling of the bell itself, temperature in the engine is kept at a very low level around about 60 degrees Celsius. And it's important. If you don't cool the motor down, the engine down, it will melt. Now, I told you about two other types of engines. This is a full flow one. There's an open cycle and a closed cycle one. They have pumps, turbines, and motors, but the pipes are arranged differently. about reaction control systems. These are small thrusters. Here's one on the lunar lander, and there's another one over there. And they are used for attitude control during re-entry. They actually turn the spacecraft forward, backward, up and down, left and right. They are used for station keeping in orbit, especially for uh, satellites. A satellite may move out of its orbit, then it's pressed back by using the reaction control system. When you dock the capsule onto the International Space Station, these little motors do the work. They're also used to point the spaceship for when you do burns of the main engine to make sure it travels in the right direction. They are there as a backup if you have to slow the satellite down to take it out of its orbit back to Earth. And then they're there for Alic to prime the fuel system. Now, this is a funny statement. I'm going to go back to this picture. You see here these tanks are full. 
by that time, this rocket is up at 90 kilometers altitude. The tanks are 30% full. And in the microgravity of space, the fuel sloshes around all over the shell. And it's very difficult to capture it in your pump intakes to burn your main engines. So what they do is they use two systems. One, they place liquid helium, highly compressed, into the tank to push the fuel in one direction. And they run the reaction control system to push the rocket upwards to make sure the fuel comes down to the bottom. It's not a very, very good system. The last rocket, or the second last sky, starship that crashed, Elon Musk claims to be a, have a situation where the engine ingested helium and lost power. Powering the reaction control systems, we use a number of things. The first way is storing liquid nitrogen in a tank from where a manifold can release it towards the selected nozzle. It is just blowing out compressed air, and that compression will push the rocket in one direction or the other. What is commonly used today is the iron drive or a plasma drive, where ionized gas, and here's a plasma motor on the right, ionized gas is accelerated by an anode and a cathode electrically and pushes it out at about 50 kilometers per second. Now, this system is not very strong and its thrust level is quite low, but it can do so for a very long duration. So it is a nice rocket to use to change position to drive a small satellite in the one direction or the other direction. It is used extensively to take a satellite from the delivery orb orbit to the final orbit. Something else which is used is hypergolic propellant. Hypergolic propellant consists of two propellants that the moment you bring them together, they spontaneously combust and push out heated gas. And there are a number of combinations that you can use. The problem with hypercolic propellants is that they work quite well, but they are quite toxic and also quite corrosive for tanks. The last thing we're going to come to is nuclear thermal rockets. This is where a nuclear thermal rocket provides, a nuclear reactor provides the thermal power in the combustion chamber. And it uses a gas, like for instance, hydrogen, to compress it in the thermal uh, combustion chamber and squirt it out the end. It could be used as a nuclear tug for interplanetary travel, where you hitch on this onto your starship and it will push it because it has a very long, slow burning rate and it can drive for a very long time. Let's look at modern heavy lift rockets. On the left, you've got the Proton and the Soyuz rockets. They're both Russian. Here's a Delta IV and the Atlas IV. They are both American rockets. Over here on the right, you have a Ariane V. That is a ESA, a European Space Agency rocket. And on the extreme right is a picture of a long march rocket, which is built by People's Republic of China. What these rockets have in common? They are all liquid fueled, mainly with LOX and liquid hydrogen or RP-1. Some of them are uh, fueled with dinitrogen 
tetroxide and unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine. The latter two are both hypergolic and toxic. All these rockets have solid fuel rocket boosters. Some in various configurations. You can strap on one booster, two boosters, five boosters. All these rockets are disposable. You use them once only. And they are very, very expensive. The space launch system that's currently being developed by Boeing will cost in excess of $2 billion per rocket. A look at partially reusable rockets. The first one that no longer in operation is the Space Shuttle. Here you see the Space Shuttle on its transporter. It has the, its reusable elements, the, trans, the orbiter here, and the solid rocket boosters on the side. The non-reusable thing is the external tank that provides the fuel to the orbiter. Here you see the orbiter taking off. It was in use from 1981 to 2011, a period of 30 years, and it flew a total of 135 missions during that time. That's four and a half missions per year. The orbiter was fitted with three rocket engines. Here you can see them at the bottom which uses both liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which was carried in this large external tank. Each of the solid rocket boosters was filled with 500 tons of fuel, which burnt out in 124 seconds. Here we shall all see the orbiter landing, and it is designed to land like an aircraft on an uh, airfield. And at the back, you have a retarding parachute to make it stop before it reaches the end of the airfield. Talk about partially reusable rockets. Continuing, SpaceX is the only other company but NASA that has a two-stage to orbit rocket. Here the rocket, the Falcon 9, is launched from Cape Kennedy carrying two astronauts. There you can see the capsule on the front. Uh, this capsule is known as the Crew Dragon and it's reusable. The first stage of the rocket, this bit over here, is designed to land propulsively on completion of the launch. And it's also reusable. The details of the first stage, 70 meters long, diameter 3.7 meters, mass 550 tons. It burns LOX and chilled kerosene. It has six Merlin sea level engines on the back. And the second stage, which is this stage over here, has its own fuel tanks, also LOX and RP-1, and it has one Merlin vacuum engine. Fuel usage is one and a half tons per second. Here you see a propulsive landing. The rocket comes down with its flamey end pointing down, and it fires its rocket just before it lands. And here you see it standing on the drone ship, at the end of its flight. I have drawn a sketch of the launch profile of the rocket just to give one an idea of time and altitude. It's launched from over here and it lands on a drone ship. The drone ship's name is, of course, I still love you for whatever reason. At time zero, it's on the launch pad. Once it travels up at about 11 kilometers at this point, it reaches a point called Q max. This is the position where the maximum dynamic pressure due to the atmosphere 
and the speed of the rocket is experienced. Its speed is then 1,454 kilometers per hour. After two minutes and 37 seconds over here, main engine cut off, all nine engines stop firing. At a height of approximately 64 kilometers and a speed of 7,800 kilometers per hour. It is immediately followed by stage separation, altitude 70 kilometers, speed 7,852 kilometers an hour. And the second stage engine starts at this point. Here you can see the trajectory of the second stage going up to the right. Once the second stage has cleared the first stage, the fairing is uh, opened up and separated. This is the fairing on the nose of the payload on a rocket that carries a payload, not astronauts, of course. And uh, it falls freely to Earth. The first stage carry on traveling after main engine's cut off due to its momentum, and it reaches an apex of about 120 kilometers and a speed of about 7,852 kilometers per hour. At this stage, the grid fins open. And here I've got a picture of the rocket on the right. And here you can see these funny grid fins that in fact flips open and sticks out 90 degrees to the body of the bottom of the rocket. These grid fins will control the downward descent and will aim the rocket towards its target way over here. Keeping in mind that traveling in this part of the space is still in airless space. Once it gets down to 53 kilometers and they use an entry burn on the rocket whereby they light up three of the nine engines just to slow the rocket down for a period of approximately 20 seconds. And it slows the rocket down from 7,900 kilometers to 5,840 kilometers. By this stage, the rocket is in the atmosphere and it's being guided by the grid fins, and it's also being retarded by the grid fins. It's falling freely, but you can see from 31 kilometers to 1.3 kilometers, its speed is reduced by 5,800 kilometers down to 656 kilometers, just by the grid fins and the atmosphere. When it gets to 1.3 kilometers, one engine starts. By this stage, the rocket is empty. It has no longer any fuel. And it lands the rocket on the drone ship. That shows the rocket coming down on the drone ship. And here it's standing on the drone ship. Now we come to the area of totally reusable rockets. They are non-operational. Blue origin, this is the, belongs to the gentleman who owns Amazon, has a two-stage rocket called New Shepard that it's busy building and designing. It is still in the early test phase. SpaceX has the Starship, which is also a two-stage to orbit. And here you see the Starship. This is the orbiter part, not the booster part. And they're busy test flying this stage at the moment. This photo is taken at Boca Chica in Texas. The important part of this Starship is that it, it is planned to be refueled once it's in orbit. 
Starship has two stages. There's stage one called the super heavy rocket, 72 meters high, nine meters wide, 3,680 tons. It carries 3,400 tons of fuel and oxidizer, stainless steel, and it has 28 of those sea level uh, Raptor engines tied to its end to push it up into the sky. Stage two of the Starship has a height of 50 meters, diameter 9 meters, and its gross mass is 1,320 tons. It is designed to carry a payload of 100 tons. And it, of course, fits on top of the Super Heavy, who will push it up into the outer space. Stainless steel, it is fitted out of three Raptor engines, sea level and three vacuum engines. The sea level engines are to land the orbiter on the ground, and the vacuum engines are there to move the orbiter to its final orbit up into the sky. Both stages, both stage one and stage two, are designed to land propulsively like the Falcon rocket stage one. They have carried out four landings already with this vehicle. The similar, in every case, the vehicle flew correctly, but in each case the landing failed, and the vehicle either crashed or, as Elon Musk said, it had a RUD, R-U-D, which stands for a Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly. They now think they know the 15th one would fly probably next week and hopefully it will land correctly. Now let's look at the future. Nuclear power for rockets will be confined to outer space. They will never use nuclear power to lift the rocket from the surface of the Earth in case something goes wrong and you end up with a nuclear explosion. So, one should never say never, but it's not feasible that they will use nuclear power. They will keep on using solid fuel boosters for a while, because this is the easiest way to escape Earth's gravity well, to get away from the Earth. But it may be outlawed in the future because of the pollutants caused by its fuel. Liquid fuel rockets will remain the primary means of escaping Earth's gravity well. And the fuels used are, as we already said, RP-1, liquid hydrogen, or liquid methane. They will continue work on the iron and plasma drives for reaction control systems and on nuclear rockets to be developed for interplanetary tugs. Work on SpaceX Raptor, which is the SpaceX engine, and Blue Origin's Blue Engine, both of them are methane powered, will continue. The SpaceX engine, a Raptor engine, is described as not the strongest not the most efficient, but probably the one that will last the longest. And in Blue Origin's case, it's very much the same. Mars will remain the primary planetary destination during the 21st century. And I hope to be still alive when they get there. And the last point that will continue is the asteroid redirect mission. This is where a rocket will be used to shift an asteroid that may be on collision course with Earth. 
such a time is currently being envisaged around about 2024 to have one of SpaceX's vehicles go up and push an asteroid to see what will happen. And that brings us to the end of the talk. This is a picture of a Falcon 9 launch from Cape Canaveral. Jan, that was fascinating. Very, very interesting. Very informative. Thank you. Johan, you once told me that you wouldn't be able to go to Mars because you're too big. Could you explain that for, uh, to us, please? Yeah, I think they will use small people to go there. I will probably not be alive, but if you look at the size of the ships and the number, specifically uh, the ones designed by NASA, size matters. And the smaller you are, the more people you can fit into a ship. Yuan, are some of the other countries like China and the Europeans also planning to build reusable rockets? The answer to that is that I'm not certain, but Russia has said they will have a reusable rocket by 2026. So they're working very hard on the reusable rocket. It's, it's a very expensive hobby if you throw the rocket away every time. At the price of more than 2 billion rand for a SLS rocket, Starship will take over from NASA in the very near future. I often wondered what SpaceX does to be able to land this rocket of theirs back on, on the drone. You explained it very well, but it still amazes me the limited amount of control they need to be able to direct that rocket. It's it's quite fascinating they're able to do it. It's, it's worthwhile reading up on Wikipedia about grid fins. This is an old system that was designed to guide guided bombs. It works very well. It retards and it guides. And one must take into account the fact that the final stages of the flight towards the drone ship is very nearly vertical. Providing you have good GPS on the rocket and on the uh, landing platform, you should be able to match the two. That's fascinating. Uh, Johan, what about the entry of UAE into the space industry? Uh, they seem suddenly to have come onto the sea. UAE, I don't think, will develop rockets. They will develop payloads. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, SpaceX recently launched a rocket called Transporter 1 that in one rocket launched 143 satellites. They will remain the prime launching agent. But UAE and other countries will be building satellites and payloads for the uh, um, SpaceX to launch. Johan, I know you spoke mostly about rockets and rocket fuel, but uh, in the beginning you talked about the various types of satellites, including the geosafety satellites. Of course, that was part of my responsibility at the SABC when I was there to be able to procure these satellites and um, use extensively for our satellite coverage for broadcasting purposes. Um, one of the problems is that the geostationary satellites are stationary above the equator. And the further south you are, the more difficult it is to get uh, a good signal from these rockets. And in the early stages, the signals weren't all that strong. Of course, they, they were increased over a period so that our coverage and the quality of the coverage improved. But in the early days, it was quite a battle. And of course, systematically, broadcast satellites have improved to make it possible for international coverage, for news feeds from all over the world, which of course has been a huge development. Comment on that. I told you about the Molina and the Tundra orbits that the Russians have that go up very high north to provide coverage in high altitudes. But of course, the disruptor in the whole system is a chap called Elon Musk. He's launching thousands of low Earth orbit satellites that will provide us with internet 
all over the world. Now, this is very important because once that Starlink system is running, I will use streamed video only. And SABC can stop transmitting to satellites in a geostationary orb. So with the advent of Starlink satellite system for internet, uh, this primary means of obtaining signals will be by internet. Yes, Johan, uh, regarding uh, space debris, with all of these non-reusable ones, are we not getting so much rubbish up there? That Because I see in the news lately there's been a part of one of the latest rockets falling in the, in the state somewhere. Uh, how, how, how serious is that problem becoming in terms of running into other pieces of, of, of shrapnel or, or scrap for, for these rocket, new rockets going up? The future, people who own satellites have the responsibility to deorbit the satellite as soon as it's no longer being used. Uh, Starlink satellites will deorbit automatically after a period of, say, seven years, and they'll be replaced by another one. Um, satellites in geostationary orbit that uh, die are pushed into what is known as a graveyard orbit outside geostationary orbit. And they're just left there. Uh, maybe one day they start falling slowly towards the sun. Uh, the rest of the space junk is one of the reasons why reusable rockets are so important. Because all the stuff that is chucked up into the sky and that don't come down is creating a problem. And it's being tracked by authorities on Earth to make sure that they don't overrun the place. Um, Elon must try to do a second stage recovery on Falcon, but they couldn't get it right. So they went on to Starship, which is designed from scratch to recover the second stage and the first stage. And it may well happen that one day we will have a Falcon that's designed as a space garbage truck to travel around and collect all the garbage that they can. And either bring it back or throw it away into outer space. That's a fascinating idea. I see there's a question in the chat box. David Pike. David asks, this is not a professional question, but I, I must ask, how do people on Earth control devices hundreds of kilometers above the Earth? It's a very good question. If you have watched the last astronaut trip to the space station by SpaceX, it is interesting to note that that capsule docked at the space station without being controlled. It was being done by computer only. So most of the control over satellites, modern satellites, is done by computer, by writing programs. And small satellites have small thrusters. In most cases, iron thrusters, tiny ones, push the thing around from various levels and to another one. And all you need to do is change the program that's controlling the satellite and send the software or the code up to the satellite will do so. So control is, is no longer a problem. It's all done by computer. It's like you, your, your same question would be, how do you control a thing like curiosity on the surface of Mars, which is so far away that it takes 23 minutes for the signal to get there? And the answer is, it's all software control. It's not hands-on control. What are the chances of a malignant body getting control of those computer programs? Hacking a computer is a general problem all around. But nowadays, anti-hacking programs are so well developed 
that they built into the operating system of the computer. And, uh, the ch and remember, the computers that drive satellites are extremely, I would like to say simple, but they're straightforward. It's not even called software, it's called firmware. Theoretically, it's not possible. Uh, or it's highly unlikely that somebody will be able to hack into them. But having said that, somebody will now work on a process on how to do this. I would like to say thank you to you, Hans. It's fascinating. And of course, this is the world we're going into. And science fiction becomes uh, real life. And thank you for giving us an insight into the intricacies of how this industry works. Thank you very much for enlightening us and giving us such a detailed and informative presentation. Thank you much, very much, everybody.